tonight on World News Weekend. Tragic shock waves. A deadly earthquake has rocked Western Turkey and Greece, leaving death and destruction behind. Officials are still assessing the damage, given the catastrophic tsunami affecting the region as well. An iconic voice silenced. Legendary actor Sean Connery is no more. Four days for four years. The battle for the top job in the United States has gotten ever so close. Tonight, President Trump and Joe Biden head to the Midwest. India's darkest moments. The female Prime Minister holds a legacy that has stood the test of time despite her tragic demise. From Mother Derana News Headquarters in Colombo, this is World News Weekend. Reporting tonight from Studio 24, here's Anisha Kutilan. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Weekend. We start off today's coverage from the Middle East as a powerful earthquake has struck off Turkey's Aegean coast and north of the Greek island of Samos. Close to 25 people are dead as rescue workers are ploughing through the debris of toppled buildings, which hasn't been easy given a tsunami being triggered within the region as well. In Izmir, the ground has just begun to shake and the building on the corner is trembling. An earthquake that started at sea, but brought down buildings across this region and spread panic. <laughs> Rescuers responded with a frantic hunt for those caught in the rubble. <laughs> Locals here said the earthquake had come without warning. The earthquake also caused large waves, a mini tsunami, that led to flooding. At least one person drowned. And here, boats swept from their marina and marooned on land. There are reports that fishermen who were at sea are still unaccounted for. There were victims too in Greece. The island of Samos has been badly damaged, flooded and battered two teenagers were killed here. The effects felt as far away as Athens, Istanbul and Bulgaria. But it is Turkey that has taken the brunt. <laughs> Nearby nations recently at diplomatic loggerheads with Turkey have offered assistance. But in Izmir, the grim hunt goes on for survivors trapped underneath all this rubble. We have breaking news to bring to you. Some sad news, in fact. Sean Connery, the Scottish-born actor who rocketed to fame as James Bond and became one of the movie's most popular and enduring international stars, has died. He was 90 years old. Connery was an audience favourite for more than 40 years and one of the screen's most reliable and distinctive leading men. Once pigeonholed as Ian Fleming's sexy agent 007, he went on to distinguish himself with a long and mature career in such films as The Wind and the Lion, The Man Who Would Be King and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Officials in the Philippines ordered the evacuation of thousands of residents today in the southern part of the Luzon Island as the world's strongest storm this year approached the Southeast Asian nation. Typhoon Goni, also known locally as Roli, is a Category 5 storm with 215 kilometers per hour and sustained winds. It will make landfall tomorrow as the strongest typhoon to hit the Philippines since Haiyan killed more than 6,300 people in 2013. Preemptive ev evacuations have started in coastal and landslide prone communities in the provinces of Camarines Norte and Camarines So, while the Albe provincial government will order residents in risky areas to leave their homes. Earlier this week, Typhoon Molave killed 22 people in the southern province of the capital Manila, which also in the projected path of Goni. New Zealanders voted to legalise euthanasia in a binding referendum, but preliminary results show they likely would not legalise recreational marijuana use. With about 83% of votes counted, New Zealanders emphatically endorsed the euthanasia measure, with 65% voting in favour and 34% voting against. The end-of-life choice referendum has been won 65.2%. An emotional moment for many of those present as New Zealand votes to legalise euthanasia. 
Campaigners say it's a victory for compassion and kindness. It's amazing. It's just amazing. Assisted dying will be legal for people suffering from a terminal illness and likely to die within six months. They must have that decision approved by two doctors. There's been widespread support for euthanasia reform in New Zealand and the referendum was expected to be passed. But opponents say it doesn't have enough safeguards in place. Now that it's passed, it, the, the risks remain. So, um, this is, so we're deeply concerned and worried for the future for vulnerable people. Legislation giving effect to the vote is expected to come into force next November. We've seen the results, the, the margins in the referendum results are such that it is highly unlikely that those results will be overturned. New Zealand will now join a handful of nations where euthanasia is legal, including Luxembourg, Belgium and Canada. In a separate non-binding vote, a proposal to legalise recreational cannabis was rejected. I'm actually quite surprised that in the progressive age that we're in, it's... Um that it hasn't gone through. We should have legalised that, absolutely. You know, take it out of your crime land and, and give it to the people. I've got a plant at home. The outcome of both referenda won't be confirmed until next week after overseas ballots and special votes are included. The race to the White House is getting a grand deal of attention from across the world as the results are just a few days away. In a final burst of campaigning, US President Donald Trump and his Democratic challenger Joe Biden have made their way to the Midwestern states in order to garner as much support as they can. The sprint to the finish running through the Midwest tonight, a campaign hotspot and COVID hot zone. Dueling events in Wisconsin and Minnesota, key battleground states battling a soaring number of coronavirus cases. Deaths are way down and where people are getting better. But infection rates are hitting a record in states like Michigan, with cases there up 85 percent in the last two weeks. President Trump hosting a rally today with no social distancing and only some masks. Joe Biden on his busiest day of campaigning yet, hoping his pandemic message helps build back a blue wall in the Midwest. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm going to shut down the virus. Biden's campaign also on offense in states that went red in 2016, like Iowa and Texas. That's where Senator Kamala Harris became the first member of a Democratic ticket in decades to campaign there this close to Election Day. Today is the last day of early voting in Texas. We want to make sure we see it through. If everything really is bigger in Texas, that includes early voting. A staggering nine million people have cast ballots already. More than everyone who voted there in all of 2016. Go vote. Yes. People need to go out and vote because that's the only way we're going to make a difference. Nationally, more than 82 million people have voted early in person or by mail, already 60 percent of the total four years ago, even with four days to go. More than 85 million people have voted early, 55 million of them by post, setting the U.S. on course for its biggest voter turnout in over a century. Let's cross over to other Derana World News special correspondent Madison Albano from New York, USA to get the latest on the early voters. Anisha, more than 85 million Americans have cast ballots, including 9 million in Texas, where the Secretary of State's office said early voting had eclipsed total turnout from 2016. Early voting has been setting records across the United States, with nationwide turnout passing 60% of the 2016 total. Texas hasn't voted for a Democrat for president since 1976, but polls suggest that Democratic no nominee Joe Biden is leading among the voters who have helped set the unprecedented early vote levels. Polls also show Biden effectively tied with Republican President Donald Trump in Texas. Trump won Texas by a 9 percentage point margin in 2016, when the total turnout reached 8.9 million. Billionaire Michael Bloomberg plans to spend $15 million in the state and Ohio in a last-minute bid to flip both Republican-leaning states. Uh, back to you, Anisha. Thank you. That was Adaderana World News Special Correspondent Madison Albano reporting from New York, USA. Britain's opposition Labour Party suspended its former leader, Jeremy Corbyn, over comments he made after a report found that under his leadership, the party was, res was responsible for unlawful harassment and discrimination. Corbyn has vowed to contest the, quote, political move made to suspend him. Jeremy Corbyn was once at the head of Labour, 
Now he's being suspended from the party altogether. This after he argued that the level of anti-Semitism in the group had been dramatically overstated, sparking widespread backlash. The former leader has long been accused of turning a blind eye to anti-Semitism during his five-year reign as party head. A watchdog report on the Labour Party from 2015 to 2020, published by the Equality and Human Rights Commission Wednesday, found that the party was responsible for unlawful acts of harassment and discrimination. The report dubbed this as inexcusable, saying that it appeared to be a result of a lack of willingness to tackle anti-Semitism rather than an inability to do so. Jeremy Corbyn quickly took to Facebook to denounce the findings, saying anti-Semitism is absolutely abhorrent. Anyone claiming there is no anti-Semitism in the Labour Party is wrong. For Corbyn's successor, Sir Keir Starmer, the report's publication marked a day of shame for the Labour Party. Hard to read. We won't tolerate anti-Semitism or the denial of anti-Semitism uh, through the suggestion that it's exaggerated or factional. And that's why I was disappointed with Jeremy Corbyn's response. And that is why appropriate action has been taken. Which... But Corbyn remains adamant that he has not done anything wrong. What I'll be doing is appealing to the party and those that have made this decision to kindly think again. All I've done is pointed out that this terrible issue of anti-Semitism does exist so we will the Labour Party is now legally obligated to draw up an action plan before the 10th of December. The programme must show how it will fulfil its commitment to zero tolerance of anti-Semitism. Failure to do so could result in prosecution. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll see you on the other side with more World News Weekend. Welcome back. Let's take you to the major updates on the COVID pandemic around the world. The United States saw a grim record rise in COVID cases, given that close to 100,000 cases were recorded in one night. Coronavirus infections in the United States passed 9 million, with the virus spreading across the country at a faster rate than previously seen. A record surge of coronavirus cases in the United States is pushing hospitals to the brink of capacity and killing up to 1,000 people a day, according to the latest figures as of Friday. Things are very, very bad in the United States right now. Um, we are having some of the largest outbreaks that we've had during the entire pandemic. Dr. Ashish Jha, dean of the Brown University School of Public Health, says the current spike is different than in the spring. It was localized to a few areas. It was localized in the Northeast. There were parts of the Midwest, uh, but it wasn't the whole nation. This surge is really happening in every region of the country, almost every single state. And we, of course, know so much more. And we saw this coming. We knew it was coming and we still have not adequately prepared for it. The United States broke its single day record for new coronavirus infections on Thursday, reporting over 91,000 new cases as 21 states reported their highest daily number of hospitalized COVID-19 patients since the pandemic started. U.S. President Donald Trump has repeatedly downplayed the virus, saying for weeks that the country is rounding the turn. The president's oldest son also tried to minimize the crisis to, quote, almost nothing. Speaking on the same day, more than 1,000 people died of COVID-19 in the U.S. This as the coronavirus sweeps states that will be crucial to next week's presidential election, such as Ohio, Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. The coronavirus, which has killed roughly 229,000 people in the United States and hammered the economy, has dominated the final days of the campaign. Since overcoming his own COVID-19 infection, Trump has maintained a frenetic pace, holding up to three rallies a day with thousands of attendees, despite concerns the events could spread the virus. Bye, Biden has held smaller events, including drive-in rallies where supporters remain in their cars for safety. Streets of the French capital were gridlocked as Parisians sought to escape the city before lockdown measures kicked in across the country. However, for some residents in smaller towns, the influx of people from big cities were unwelcome. Just hours before France went into its second coronavirus lockdown, 
Parisians piled out of the capital with endless queues of traffic filling roads in and around the city. As with the last lockdown, many headed for the country or to their second homes. Here in the western French seaside resort of La Bolle, many locals are afraid of being infected by people coming from elsewhere in the country, especially big cities like Paris. While authorities are in agreement, they say it's a tricky balance to strike for a destination that attracts many tourists. During the first lockdown in spring, the arrival of Parisians in certain parts of France that had been less affected by COVID-19 caused a spike in cases of infection. Meanwhile, some city dwellers who were already in La Bolle have decided to return home because of the lockdown. Others have decided to stay on, shunning another uncomfortable period in the French capital. People on holiday here have until Sunday to return home. From the start of next week, people will not be permitted to travel between regions. Belgium has announced a return to a national lockdown as the latest coronavirus figures show it has the highest infection rate in Europe. Non-essential shops and businesses offering personal services, like hair salons, have been ordered to close from Monday until the middle of December. It's a coronavirus tsunami, a crippling second wave that health officials say they can no longer control. The intensive care beds for COVID-19 patients in this hospital in Liège are full. Admissions have been doubling every eight days. The ventilators, monitors and glass isolation units are signs of a crisis worse than the first wave in the spring. If the pressure continues, doctors here say they may soon be forced to choose who receives life-saving care. Wallonia, the southern French-speaking region of Belgium, now has one of the highest rates of infection in the world, with one in every three tests coming back positive. From the start, Belgium has been vulnerable to the virus. It's densely populated with high rates of cross-border travel. The near-total relaxation of restrictions over the summer, combined with bad weather and the return of schools in the fall, have created a perfect storm. The situation has become so critical in the Wallonia region that some hospitals are asking doctors and nurses to keep working, even if they've tested positive for the virus, as long as they're not displaying symptoms. It's to prevent the healthcare system from total collapse. Like neighbouring France, Belgium has now introduced a new national lockdown, closing all non-essential businesses and limiting social contacts. But experts fear urgent action was needed earlier. But like elsewhere in Europe, there are signs of lockdown fatigue and rising anger towards national governments. Small demonstrations have taken place in Belgium, but have stopped short of the violence and unrest seen on the streets of Italy and Germany. Welcome back to World News Weekend. Despite a pandemic that shocked the entire economy and impending antitrust lawsuits, online mid-techs are doing rather well. Amazon, Apple, Google and Facebook have recorded high revenues within the last quarter. As the world went home and got online, global tech firms turned out to be the big winners of the coronavirus pandemic. The quarterly combined profit of Apple, Alphabet, Facebook and Amazon has hit 38 billion US dollars. Amazon sales in the third quarter surged by 37% as compared to last year and profits tripled to a record 6.3 billion US dollars. This as families increasingly turned to online shopping. But Amazon warns that the COVID-19 crisis has also cost the firm some 2.5 billion US dollars. Facebook saw users jump 15% from last year, although its North American users dropped, which the company warns is a longer-term trend. As businesses return to spending on online advertising after a dry spell in spring, Alphabet, the parent company of Google, saw profits jump by almost 60% to 11 billion US dollars. At Apple, things are less rosy. But the firm says its 20% drop in iPhone revenue is due to buyers holding out for the latest 5G-enabled iPhone. Both Alphabet and Facebook warned that despite strong quarterly gains, 2021 could be a difficult year as the effects of the pandemic continue to be felt. 
and lawmakers threaten to take action against big tech over competition concerns. And finally tonight, let's take a peek to the past. It was on a day like today in the year 1984 that Indira Gandhi, former Prime Minister of India, was killed by her bodyguards. The assassination sparked four days of riots that left more than 8,000 Indian Sikhs dead in revenge attacks. Indira Priyadarshini Gandhi was an Indian politician and a central figure of the Indian National Congress. She was the first and, to date, only female Prime Minister of India. Indira Gandhi was the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India. She served as Prime Minister from 1966 to 1977 and again from 1980 until her assassination in October 1984, making her the second longest serving Indian Prime Minister after her father. Today marks her 36th death anniversary. That's it from all of us at World News Weekend. Thank you for joining me. I'm Anusha Kutlan. Good night.